The presenting sponsor of Pod Save America is Blue Apron. For less than $10 per person per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash crooked. Blue Apron, a better way. They're all to cowards for not resigning. <laughs> Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On today's show, we will be joined by Vice News Tonight correspondent Ellie Reeve. She is still in Charlottesville. She's been there since Friday covering the events. She has an outstanding Vice special on what's been going on in Charlottesville that everyone should watch. Uh, it's been viewed more than 23 million times on Facebook right now, so everyone go check it out if you haven't seen it. We're also going to be talking about the rise of extremism and white supremacy with Leisha Brooks of the Southern Poverty Law Center. So, big show today. Before we begin, we're going on tour, Dan. Pod Tours America. I'm excited. Yeah, it's going to be very exciting. If you guys go to crooked.com slash tour and enter the code crooked for the presale, uh, we have tickets on sale now for uh, all of the events we'll be doing in October, November, and December. We got events in Madison, Ann Arbor, Cleveland, Chicago, Philly, DC, Richmond, Santa Barbara, Sacramento, and Oakland. The first response from a lot of people is like, why aren't you going to this city? Why aren't you going to this city? We're going to a lot of cities. In 2018, if your city's not on the list this time around for the next three months, it's probably going to be on the list in 2018. Should you just apologize to Boston now? Yeah, we had, you know what, and in the original draft of the schedule, Boston was in December, but we had to change it up a little bit. Just for scheduling reasons. because because it was Boston in December <laughs> that, that might have been one of the reasons <laughs> yeah well we had some people traveling for the holidays and it was just a lot but we are getting to Boston so just for the, all the Boston people so everyone it's uh, crooked dot com slash tour again code is crooked and then I think general sales go on sale Friday general ticket sales are Friday so also check out Tommy's Pod Save the World this week. He talks to former Secretary of Homeland Security Janet Napolitano about her efforts to combat right-wing extremists when she was uh, Homeland Security Secretary in the Obama administration. He's also joined by Deputy CIA Director David Cohen. Anna Marie Cox is talking to Jane Coaston and Tom Nichols on With Friends Like These, which drops tomorrow. So um, big week for Crooked Media Pods. Also, happy birthday to John Lovett today. Oh, you, really? Yeah, he's not even coming into the office. He's uh, or coming into the studio to tape the ads. We already did them. So uh, <laughs> probably because he's sleeping late because it's his birthday and he deserves it. So it's Love It's oh, birthday, birthday today, everyone. Love it. Yeah. Okay. Love it and I had a blast at he told me. San Francisco on Friday. He yeah, said that, He said that you two and Holly uh, really had some fun. Yeah, we, we went out to Mexican afterwards. Wow. We got to try delicious barbecue from some friends of the pod at South Paul Barbecue. I mean, Amazing. we were like... We benefited greatly from Tribe Called Quest bailing at the last minute, so it really... Uh, I heard about we were, that. We were the number one act uh, at that time. <laughs> well, good job. Good job there. Okay, enough talking about fun stuff. Now we have to talk about daily reality that is politics. So this morning, Trump is tweeting about how we can never replace the beauty of Confederate monuments, which, you know, if you were just waking up after a week of sleep, you might say, how did we get here? What? <laughs> so let's begin with... Trump's infrastructure press conference on Tuesday, which went slightly off the rails and uh, led Glenn Thresh and Maggie Haberman of the New York Times to pen the following lead. President Trump buoyed the white nationalist movement on Tuesday as no president has done in generations, equating activists protesting racism with the neo-Nazis and white supremacists who rampaged in Charlottesville, Virginia over the weekend. Dan, did you watch this press conference live? And what was your reaction? I did. Um, first, I want to say we criticize, you know, both sides journalism or people sort of soft pedal things. Yeah. And kudos to the New York Times for calling this exactly what it is and making the point that there is no other side to the white supremacy argument and okay. not treating it as if it's a debate over infrastructure policy. It's a moral issue. And like that was a powerful lead and there was a there was a, there were way, many ways to soft pedal that and try to treat it as a this side versus that side or he said she said and they did that right they perfectly met the awful moment i thought in uh with yes. that story i did watch it and 
I mean, it was just, he's just there. He's in Trump Tower lobby. He's surrounded by the wife of his arch enemy, Mitch McConnell. <laughs> Uh, notice globalist cuck uh, Gary Cohn, Steve Mnuchin. Uh, other globalist cuck Steve Mnuchin, and he's just talking about infrastructure, which is something presidents do a lot. And then it just every word once he started talking about this issue, it got crazier. Like you thought, I was like, oh, that's a terrible thing. He didn't really want to say what he said on Monday, so he went back to a Saturday statement, which is offensive and horrendous, but not super surprising. And then he went so much further, yeah. than that. And he just, I just, you like couldn't believe it as it was happening. I mean, I, I expected as the press conference began that the more questions he took, the angrier he'd get, and the greater the chance he'd say something really stupid and repugnant. I did not expect it to be quite so stupid and repugnant. At first, he's like, I'm just going to reread the Saturday statement, and then he seems to get a little angrier, and then the reporters keep pressing him, and then at one point you see him just sort of lose it and think, fuck this, I'm going to say whatever I want to say. It's important to start by pointing out that very little of what Trump said about Charlottesville was true. Uh, He said that that not all of the protesters there were neo-Nazis and white supremacists, and some were very fine people who were, quote, innocently protesting. And twice he mentioned the torch rally on Friday night as evidence of this. But, like, anyone can see from the video footage, if you watch the Vice video footage, that this isn't true. You can see the Confederate flags and the Hitler salutes. You can hear hundreds of them chanting the Nazi saying, blood and soil, Jews will not replace us. You can hear them screaming gay and racial epithets. There was no other group of protesters. And if you're just an ordinary citizen who came to peacefully protest the removal of a statue and you're surrounded by a bunch of assholes with guns doing Hitler salutes and screaming Jews will not replace us, you either leave or you're not that innocent. And it's like, and, and last night, I don't know if you saw the, the gathering last night in Charlottesville, it was a vigil and a march. When the Nazis and white supremacists didn't show up to that, there was no violence. It was completely peaceful. It's very obvious who, <laughs> it's very obvious that this, there was not innocent people in this, just protesting these Confederate statues. It was a, it was a gathering for Nazis and white supremacists. I mean, it's also important to note the Confederate statue is the excuse. It right. is not the reason they were there. It was an opportunity to all show up and be racist. Like it was not, this is not some long held belief of theirs. And it's just mind boggling that we are having it, that the president of the United States is having a debate about the culpability between two groups when one of them is Nazis. Like it's just so fucking crazy. It's hard to possibly fathom. Like there is no, there are no two sides to this. Like we live in a very polarized country, but you would think the one thing that the overall majority of people, including the president of the United States, could agree on is that Nazis are wrong and the other people are probably right. Full stop. Full stop. I mean, and you have to, so you have to wonder, like, he gets all these facts wrong. He just, you know, comes up with this alternative story These alter- of, of what happened in Charlottesville. Like, where is the president of the United States getting his information from? And then you realize, as Ashley Feinberg of Wired wrote a story about this, noted, that almost everything he said in his press conference came directly from Fox News. All of I the- am <laughs> fucking shocked. But it's important because the way that Fox talks about this, which is not, you know, so overt that they're saying, no, 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 we, we agree with the white supremacists and the neo-Nazis. It's Democrats are using race and identity politics as a wedge issue. This is the, the leftist mobs were just as violent. There were some innocent people there on the right just talking, you know, the high minded debates about Confederate statues, right? That's how this is filtered through Fox. And it's not just getting to the president and, have, and where he speaks about it in front of the whole country, which is shocking and awful enough. It's also that's what millions and millions of people around the country who watch Fox and other or get their news from other right wing. That's how they're processing what's happened. So it's no wonder they have a distorted view of what happened. Yeah, and this is not something that happened when Donald Trump decided to get off the Celebrity Apprentice and run for office. Right. This is the strategy of the Republican Party going back to the age of Richard Nixon. And Roger Ailes, who essentially started Fox News, 
ran the George H.W. Bush campaign against Michael Dukakis. And George H.W. Bush is a truly decent human being, but he did, he ran a campaign ad called the Willie Horton ad, which is one of the most racist ads to ever be on television until Donald Trump showed up. And Roger Ailes ran that. And the whole point of it is white people should be scared of non-white people. And then he started Fox News. And that has been the argument of the Republican Party and Fox News with Fox News in the charge for decades now. The idea that non-white people are getting your tax dollars and not working, the, the Reagan idea of welfare queens, the idea that there are these undocumented people storming across the border to, co- to commit crimes, to be rapists, as Donald Trump called them, to take jobs that, that hardworking white people want, the idea that there are Muslims in our communities who want to behead us. This has been the argument they're making. So it's no... It's not a leap. Surprise <laughs> that this is where we end, ended up. And they have been sort of riding a tiger for decades now. And this is the, the inevitable end result of their strategy. It is not surprising at all. Uh, what's surprising is that the President of the United States is now part and parcel of that whole strategy in the most overt way possible. In, in some would say a sloppy way, right? It's not even like there's a wink and a nod anymore. It's just, it's out there. Uh, yeah. But this I, is this is not a dog whistle. This is a it's bullhorn. A, it's a bullhorn. Can we talk about the statue debate though? Because like some conservatives are weighed in saying, "Well, they shouldn't be taken down. It's erasing history. It's a complicated debate. All that kind of stuff." Here's the thing I want to talk about, which is statues don't just ask us to remember people. They ask us to celebrate people. That's why you build a statue. We don't we don't build. People have pointed this out online, but look, we don't build statues of Hitler to memorialize the Holocaust. We don't build statues of Osama bin Laden to memorialize 9-11. We have 300 years of history in this country, and we really want statues in our cities that forever memorialize the four years when a group of white Americans fought against the United States in order to keep black Americans enslaved. That's, That's what we want to put in our public parks. We can't think of any other cities. Like, you could take, you know, it's not about erasing history. You could take those statues and you can put them in a museum along with the Confederate flag, which is where that all belongs. And then people can learn about that when they go to the museum. They can learn about their history. Putting a statue in a public square in our cities and in our parks, that says that we're celebrating something. And the Confederacy is literally nothing to celebrate. It was a rebellion against the United States of America for the purpose of defending the institution of slavery. That's what it was. And it would be one thing. This would be a a more nuanced debate if these were statues that were built in the 1860s. They were not. (laughs) They were not. They were built in the 1960s. Why are they built in the 1960s? Because that's when people were – when the civil rights movement happened and they wanted – and so the the response to that is to go back and celebrate the days of slavery. It was actually – there was a big surge of that was before that. It was during during Reconstruction and – the, the biggest surge of Confederate monument building co- coincided with the biggest surge of lynchings and the resurgence of the KKK after Reconstruction once the Jim Crow era started. And then there was another surge, like you said, right, uh, right before the so I mean, you can look at the charts and those surges of building coincide with some of the most, you know, hateful periods in our history. Yes. The more pissed off that people got about African-Americans or other groups getting more rights, the more statues that were built. It seems like that's something we should not celebrate. No. The, the, I saw this theory online, which is that one of the reasons that Trump cares about this so much is he's very worried about his statue being uh, torn down one day. Guess what? There will be no Donald there, Trump statue. There, that is not a thing that will happen. So do not worry, sir. This, this is not a problem that's going to affect you. I certainly hope not. So let's talk about... And then every, oh, then there's the then there's the slippery slope argument, which Trump has been making too. Like, oh... You know, if we tear down all the Confederate statues, then when do we stop? Why don't we tear down a uh, George Washington statue or Thomas Jefferson statue since they were slaveholders? It's like, my response to that is, you know what? Let's start with the Confederate statues. Let's take them down, and then you can have some other debate. Like, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, obviously slave owners, but, like, we're talking about people with redeeming qualities, with things that we can all, with, with qualities and achievements that we can also celebrate, even as they have qualities that we can criticize there is no redeeming quality there's nothing to celebrate about robert e lee he led a rebellion against the united states of america for the purpose of defending the institution of slavery it's just 
it have you seen the polling that shows that majorities of americans oppose yeah. the pulling down of these and do you I know have, my response to that is i don't care yeah i mean i do not care it is, well, that is look, not the point this is also kind of pulling like a lot of to a lot of people's credit they hadn't really thought about it for a long time and they probably haven't thought about i bet opinions in a couple of weeks after this will be much more sharply... I, I bet not as many people will be opposed because now people are going to... Because of what we've seen over the last couple of weeks, people are going to associate this with what they saw, the hate that they saw in Charlottesville. So this is... I'd love to, like, dig into more polling on this because I think a lot of people are probably were like, well, I haven't given much thought to this, you know? And again, I, I, I tweeted about this the other day. You should take a look at... Read Mitch Lander, the mayor of New Orleans' speech... Uh, after New Orleans took down their Confederate monuments, which only happened a couple months ago. It's a very, very powerful speech, one of the best speeches I've read in years. And it, he makes a very good case for why these monuments should be taken down, you know, even, and, and he makes that case as a Southerner. So it is, uh, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good read. Yeah, it's a great speech. So let's talk about the reaction to Trump's press conference, which has unfolded over the last couple of days. Again, I'll go with the New York Times, their lead last night. President Trump found himself increasingly isolated in a racial crisis of his own making on Wednesday, abandoned by the nation's top business executives, contradicted by military leaders, and shunned by Republicans outraged by his defense of white nationalist protesters in Charlottesville. It's quite a lead. We saw Do you yes- think he was shunned by Republicans? Yeah, we should get to that. <laughs> well, I want to break out all the different groups here. Let's talk about the CEOs, talk about the... Well, so the military... Was, it was a pretty extraordinary day where the heads of the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, and the National Guard, all five armed services chiefs, posted statements on social media condemning neo-Nazis and racism. Obviously, they didn't call out their commander-in-chief by name, but the fact that they posted those statements is unprecedented. You know, never, something like that has never happened before. So that was something. CEOs, a couple dozen CEOs from the country's biggest companies resigned en masse from Trump's economic councils after quite a bit of pressure. We should thank the organization The Color of Change led that fight. Trump, of course, tweeted that he dissolved the councils first, which is a lie. Yeah. They all you quit. can't dump me. I'm dumping you. <laughs> exactly. No, and that's and look, that is a uh, a good that should teach us a lesson. Uh, what happened with the CEOs about the power of public pressure and activism? A lot of these CEOs would not have quit those councils had it not been for all the pressure they received online. And people should know, like a lot of these CEOs, a lot of these companies, they get they monitor social media when there's mentions of their CEOs and mentions of their companies. It matters and makes a difference to them, especially the biggest consumer facing companies. You know, when they hear from people who were opposed to what Donald Trump did and those voices are louder than the people supporting him, they're going to make the they're going to make the right decision. Do you think it matters? I think all of this stuff matters. I think to the degree, you know, you can argue about how much it matters. I don't think that a bunch of CEOs jumping off a council, which was largely symbolic, fixes a problem. I think it sends a signal that, you know, that we don't stand, you know, that we can't stand, we don't stand for this, that this is, that, that we have a line in the sand and he has crossed that line and we are not going to associate our companies with this man. I agree with that. I just want to be clear. I do think it matters. And I think yeah. it matters for a long lines of what you said, which is we are living in an, this is, in, this is abnormal. This is extraordinary what Trump is doing and saying and the views that he clearly holds. And for mainstream consumer brands like Pepsi or Campbell's Soup to grant him this patina of normalcy by showing up to a meeting with him aids and abets a deeply disturbed ideology that is now in the highest seat of power in this country. Yep, I totally agree with that. I mean, we're, we're we're saying that the President of the United States is a racist, which he has, I believe he has proved over and over again the last couple in the last week or so it's hard for people in their minds to see to hear the president being called the racist or to believe that what he said was racist at least and then to see these ceos from pepsi and dell and general electric and all these company whirlpool and johnson and johnson and all these companies you know the pictures of them sitting with him in the white house because 
then you have this cognitive dissonance where you say, well, yeah, maybe it was racist what he said, but all these companies that we know that we buy stuff from, they're sitting with him. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's not racist. That's why it's important for them to step down. I agree with that. I'm surprised. Like, it is not surprising that it took so long, but when you really, they had no other option because I think their employees would have revolted over this, yeah. which is certainly is what drove a lot of what happened with some of the Silicon Valley companies uh, and some of the earlier instances of this. But the the arguments for staying were so stupid that it's amazing it took them days to figure some of these folks to take days to figure out. Yeah. Uh, happy with the outcome, but it was uh, some of them waited a little too long. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Republicans. So, <laughs> not one apparently, not one Republican would go on television yesterday to defend Donald Trump. I think Chuck Todd said they invited all 52 Republican senators to come on and defend uh, Trump, and not one would do it. And yet, as Think Progress noted, only 17 of the 292 congressional Republicans have criticized Trump by name over the last week. So what do you think? I think that we have lowered the bar. The idea that you just that a Republican can put out a statement, like Mitch McConnell, for instance, who leaked to reporters that he was so upset about this, and then he put out a version of verbal applesauce that just said that Nazism and white supremacy were bad without mentioning Trump's name. Well, like no fucking shit. Like I that know. is obvious. Like we all, except for Trump and some of his minions, like it was, it was at least an accepted part of political discourse that white supremacy was wrong and something that should be chastised. And now it's like, Oh, how courageous. What the moral authority of Paul fucking Ryan that he said Nazis are bad with, why, like subtweeting Trump will have the fucking courage to say something about it. Because you know what? They are res- as responsible for this as Donald Trump. Yeah. The, Paul Ryan, they Mitch all stood McConnell, by him. John they stood Boehner, by him. they coddled this anger. They knew it was there. And they may not be white supremacists or Nazis or racists themselves, but they sure as fuck wanted the votes of racists. They were willing to tolerate birtherism in the hopes it would help them win elections. They have allowed people like Steve King, one of the most racist people in America, to be in their caucus, seek out their votes, pat him on the back, eat fucking lunch with him once a week, and this is where we wind up. None of them, with the brief exception of John McCain during the 2008 election, the fucking courage to do anything. All of these people, Mitt Romney himself, who has shown a lot of Trump courage about Trump in recent years, all of those Republicans in 2012 went hat in hand to Trump Tower to kiss the ring after Trump had been a birther for years to seek his endorsement. Reince Priebus sought his support and money. All of these people have they have they have known this was happening in their party and done nothing about it because they thought it helped them politically. So spare me your fucking statements. As yeah. you can tell, I'm, I'm worked up about this. <laughs> no, man. I mean, look, love it. Said the other day, I think he tweeted this that uh, some of these statements reek of bad conference calls. <laughs> you, you can hear the conference call with all the advisors, right? Like, we have to say something. The boss has to say something about this. Should we put Trump's name in it? Eh, I don't. Want, I don't think they should do that. If they put Trump's name in it, then they're going to be a target. He's going to go after them. I don't think we want to go that far. I think the base is on the other side of this one. I think the base probably likes what he did. So maybe. But but you know what? The media is hounding us. We're going to get in trouble if we don't put out any statement at all. Let's just do a general condemnation of white supremacy and Nazism. Leave it at that. We won't mention Trump. No one will notice. We won't get any calls about it. Right. Yeah, it's low. It's lowest common denominator morality. It is. I mean, the most important story in the country right now is that the president of the United States is defending Nazis and white supremacists. If you're a politician and your statement doesn't offer a specific view on that, don't bother releasing the statement. You know, Not good. Um, and so did you notice that some that uh, Jerry Nadler, Democratic representative from New York, has introduced a resolution of censure against the president? Uh, censure is basically a formal disapproval that Congress can pass and it can censure you can they can censure a president they can censure a fellow member of Congress a senator a representative they're very rare 
it's basically like a step below impeachment, right? You don't remove the person from office. Um, if you censure another member of the House or the Senate, they can be removed from various committee chairmanships. I think only Andrew Jackson has been censured. They tried to censure Bill Clinton uh, around the Monica Lewinsky scandal. So anyway, Nadler has introduced a censure resolution backed by a couple Democrats. What do you think about this? Because my thing is, like, if you're a Republican, and Jennifer Rubin, who is a conservative columnist, the Washington Post, wrote this yesterday. She goes, if you're a Republican, the only thing that matters is if you sign on to this censure, if you devote to censure the president. Otherwise, your statements don't really matter that much. I support it. I think let's put people on record. If you are so morally outraged by the president's support of Nazis, it's I mean, that's such a fucking crazy thing to say. But if you were so <laughs> outraged by it, do something about it and put your put yourself on record that you disapprove of what Donald Trump said, not the general concept of racism, but of the racist in chief. And if you're willing to do that, that's great. And I think voters should know if you were unwilling to do it. So. I, I think this is the right thing to do. It's a good idea. And let's let's see how much, how outraged these Republicans really are. Right. Yeah. I mean, to put up or shut up. Notice that no, no one, uh, we talked about the CEOs resigning. Notice no one from the Evangelical Council has resigned. A religious group of people there. Why is, it is, I want to know why there's not more pressure on these people. Is it just assumed that, <laughs> that these faith leaders are going to be totally okay with racism and white supremacy and everything else that has come from Trump. How did like, I understand why all the pressure was put on the CEOs, but why, like, what is, what is the argument from some of these evangelical leaders? Why they would, why they would stay. And it really goes to some of the real, the sort of the tension within, I mean, Trump is, is a truly immoral human being, yet he got tremendous support from the evangelical community and it, the evangelical leadership for sure. And it just raises a lot of questions about what is driving their political support. And if you can't, if one person on hmm. that council can't I think, can't I, walk I, think I might know some of this, the answers to those questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm subtweeting them. I, guess. I, don't, I don't believe it is their, uh, I don't believe it is their faith. Yeah. It's pretty sad, pretty sad state of affairs yeah. there. Should we talk about the staff? We have been told by uh, many media outlets, many anonymous sources and many media outlets, that Gary Cohn was outraged and very angry. He was so outraged and angry, he went right back to his desk and got to work. So yeah, Gary's upset, Dina Powell's upset, Jared and Ivanka, they, they've they been trying to moderate their their father and father-in-law you know, on this issue, but uh, they were on vacation, so they really couldn't be bothered. I'm just, this, it makes me so angry because you know what? None of this matters. These people have no influence over their boss. They can't control him. They can't persuade him. They can't convince him. He doesn't take their advice. They are useless to talk about anymore. They are useless. I find these people to be morally bankrupt. If you, if you are so upset that you will dispatch your friends or your personal PR firm, wherever the fuck it is, to call reports so people are upset you are, then fucking quit or shut the fuck up. Yeah, like, and <laughs> at least at least Steve Bannon is out there just admitting that he's happy about all this on the record. You know, like he's just like, yeah, this was this is what I wanted. Trump killed it in that press conference. Good for him. The rest of them, they don't have the courage to talk on the record about how they feel. They just have to go. They have to go call up Jonathan Swan at Axios, and you know, let them know that people are very upset, and they're or call up the New York Times or call up the Washington Post and go on background anonymously to talk about how upset they are. One of the things that's been bothering me recently is: Do you ever remember reading about what Obama NEC chair Gene Sperling felt? What his emotional, <laughs> what his emotions were on any given day? Do you ever remember I, reading a story about? how you felt about some strategic decision or whether I was in a good mood or I had gone to an office somewhere and the feeling isolated. No. <laughs> I did and not. like we are living in this soup weird reality show with these incompetent people. And the argument for the amount of coverage on the staff from reporters has been, it's important because who's up, who's down, who feels happy, who feels sad, gives you some clue to what the Trump administration is going to do. And it doesn't. I think it does not. 
these people are irrelevant. There's only one person that matters, and that person is Donald J. Trump. Whether Steve Bannon is in a good mood or he's on the rise or John Kelly is is monitoring phone calls, none of it fucking matters. All that matters is Trump. So let's spend less time trying to read Steve Bannon's mood ring and more times trying to find out what the corruption, the Russia investigation, all the other stuff that we is a massive waste of resources in American time. I to to know whether Steve Bannon, whether yep. Steve Miller is friends with Javanka or Bannon. It's like it is as if the entire media was covering a seventh grade class somewhere. That's right. And look, they do that often. They did that. They do that with every administration, right? There's more focus on the personalities and the drama and the high school nature of it all. It matters even less in this administration because no one has any influence over Donald Trump at all. He just does whatever he wants to do. So we should just stop talking about all of them. Or at least if you want to go read all that stuff because it's fun soap opera reality TV garbage and you're just interested in that, go for it. But don't think what you're reading tells you anything about what Donald Trump is going to do. It's like the real housewives uh, yes. are destroying our government. So let's talk about is this a breaking point? What has happened over this week? Has something fundamentally changed? You know, we should talk about public opinion because what inevitably happens after an event like this is there's a couple days of outrage where like you said you know i think the media has done an outstanding job not both sides in this you know meeting the moment of how awful this is in a lot of their coverage i think cnn has done a great job i think new york times washington post but now the polls start coming out right and this morning we saw a cbs poll that said 67 percent of republicans agree support donald trump's response to charlottesville and you can already see now and you're starting to see now a few more stories new york times had some of these with interviews with the trump supporters who are saying oh i think he did the right thing i think this was i I agree with him and you can start to see now where this coverage could go in the next week which is eventually we're going to get to the have democrats overplayed their hand because um, all this talk about racism only helps Trump with his base. You know, you can just see that coming. And I don't really know what to do about it. Okay, I have some thoughts here. Mm. One, if you read a poll which says, well, first, let's talk about the reporters. If you interview people who identify themselves as Trump supporters, they're going to support Trump. Yeah. It is selection bias in how you do it. If you were to randomly call people who you had on file for having who supported Trump in a poll six months ago, and then you asked a bunch of those people how they felt about it, that's the way to do it. But walking into a coffee shop in the reddest part of the country and saying, hey, do you support Trump when you talk to the New York Times? And then being shocked when they tell you that they support Trump is pretty asinine. Second, if you read a poll, like it is, if I was a Republican and I saw that two thirds of my fellow Republicans supported the way Donald Trump has handled this in in bolstering Nazis and white supremacists, I would go looking for another party. But if you're looking at the politics of this, if you could say, oh, two thirds of, of Republicans support Trump, or the other way to look at it is he lost 20 per, more than 20 points of his support over this. Right. And if 67%, I've never seen Trump poll so low with Republicans over something. Third point. I don't care if Democrats ever play their hand here. That's not the fucking point. I this totally is not agree. actually a like it's the Bannon argument. If Democrats talk about race, we'll win. Well, if the President of the United States is endorsing and supporting white supremacists and Nazis, someone better stand up and fucking say something. And I don't really care what the polls say about it. This is actually a moral issue, not a political issue. We can worry about the politics later, but we have to do the right thing here. Let's not poll test our response to what Trump is saying. That's not yeah. the right approach. And look, we're not dumb here. We know, like, I'm fully aware we all lived through 2016 now. We saw that every time, you know, Donald Trump would say something racist or sexist, it would lure Hillary Clinton in to responding. And then that was the news of the day. And then maybe she wasn't talking about the economy. And so it didn't help the campaign. Like, I get that. And I get that sometimes he he wants to drive a wedge through the party and through the country 
by using racially divisive rhetoric and what he did this week. Bannon said it. Bannon admitted that that, that what they're hoping for is to use this as a wedge issue. We all get that. But there's sometimes you just have to stand up and say it's fucking wrong. And it doesn't matter about the politics. That's right. It's just... Man. Okay. When we come back, we will talk to Vice News' Ellie Reeve. Pod Save America is brought to you by Peloton. Peloton? Whoa! This is the first time we've had this ad. Do you want the convenience of joining a group cycling class whenever you want, right in your own living room? Don't let a busy schedule keep you from getting a great workout in, John. So, John, I have this bike in my uh, office, and as you guys can all imagine. Your office? Yeah, well, it's an empty room where there used to be writing. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> cool, but cool, uh, cool. I have this bike in there. I mean, really, it's the second bedroom but I don't have guests. So anyway, it's got a bike in there now and it's really actually very cool. You can do like a class in your house and so you don't have to go anywhere. It actually, it's cool. I like it. Discover this cutting edge indoor cycling bike that brings the studio experience to your home. Peloton is offering listeners a limited time offer. Go to pelotoncycle.com, enter the code PODSAVEAMERICA at checkout and get 20% off accessories with your Peloton bike purchase. Get a great workout at home anytime you want. Go to pelotoncycle.com, use the code PODSAVEAMERICA and get started. Hmm. Pod Save America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Okay. We know this one. Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? John, you have to post to all the job, top job sites at the same time. How many clicks? I feel like they want it to be two clicks. It's only one. What? How one is click. that even possible? Well, because their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. Have they had the number of clicks? Oh, you know who is two clicks was two clicks Seek Geek. Say your entire jobs council just quit. Are you looking to fill a Are jobs council? Are you looking council? to fill a jobs council because you lost them all because you You're defended Nazis and white supremacists? <laughs> if so, you might want to use ZipRecruiter. Hi, are you a president who's also a pariah? <laughs> That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. You know what the good news is for uh, Trump? He doesn't have to use ZipRecruiter for all the jobs that the supposedly decent Republicans who haven't left haven't left. <laughs> That's true. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, Pod Save America listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. One more time. What is it? You mean ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked? That's the one. Okay. On the pod with us today, from Vice News Tonight, correspondent Ellie Reeve. Ellie, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So we just played a quick clip from the episode of Vice News you did on Charlottesville. I believe it aired on on Monday. So you've been in Charlottesville since Friday morning. What made you go down there? And how did you end up interviewing Chris Cantwell, the white supremacist speaker with Unite the Right that you spent some time with? I've been covering the alt-right for about a year and a half, Mm -hmm. and looking at sort of the promotional materials about the event, I knew that it was going to bring together a lot of groups that had been fighting amongst each other. So I thought it would be big. Then I did some reporting and realized the turnout would be pretty big, so I decided to come down. Of course, I didn't think it'd be violent like this. Yeah. Can you compare what you've seen in Charlottesville to President Trump's description of the scene? Were there a lot of... Did you see any fine people who were innocently protesting with Unite the Right? Were, there, were the leftist mobs there? Were they equally violent? Or what did yeah. you see? It was shocking to me that he said he pinpointed Friday night as the night that there were nice people. That was the night where it was so clearly organized. Everyone had tiki torches. Those who didn't show up with tiki torches were given tiki torches, right? Mm. They had very clear organizing. It was an unannounced event um, where they all showed up on this field on the UVA campus. Like, there was security being run by Army veterans. There there were people doing crowd control. Like, there was no one there who was, like, just really into Robert E. Lee. Did you, when you were 
in the van with these folks or in sort of embedded with them. Did you fear for your safety or had you sort of built relationships with these people prior to this? I'd never talked to Campbell before this story, but they are familiar with my reporting. But they don't like the press and they don't like women. So, yeah, there were moments that I thought it was a little hairy. Um, But I knew that in that van, I knew that if I got that guy ranting about the Jews, they wouldn't kick us out. So, you know, I let him go. Now, one of the people filming that was my producer, Josh Davis, who's Jewish. So, yeah, there were some tough calls. Uh, at some point. Were you surprised by how openly Cantwell and others were advocating violence? We can listen to a clip of him in the hotel with you. What do you think this means for the next alt-right protest? I say it's going to be really tough to top, but we're up to the challenge. Wait, why? Why? Tough to top. I mean, someone died. I I think that a lot more people are going to die before we're done here, frankly. Why? Why? Because people die every day. Right? I mean, do you... But not do you, like a heart attack. I mean, violent death. Well, people die violent deaths all the time, right? Like, this is part of the reason that we want an ethno state, right? So, like, the, the blacks are killing each other in staggering numbers from coast to coast. We don't really want to have a part of that anymore. And so, the fact that they resist us when we say, hey, we want a homeland, is not shocking to me, all right? These, these people want violence, and the right is just meeting market demand. Did it surprise you that he was so open about that? That was what was most surprising about me. I thought that even that publicly, even if they were advocating violence, that they would try to be quiet about it with the media. But it seemed like that was just he was fine with it. I think there might be some disagreements over PR strategy among some of them. But Hmm. I had heard sentiments like that, that there needs to be violence before there's some kind of revolution and movement Hmm. towards fascism. I, I wasn't expecting him to have quite so many guns. I wasn't expecting him to say that killing Heather Heyer was a justified and righteous thing to do. So that did shock me. Cantwell and the guy in the van with you are figures that are familiar to people because, you know, we sort of sometimes see these Ku Klux Klan members or like very clear, you know, obvious neo-Nazis. What is the relationship between folks like them and like Jason Kessler, who I guess organized this, and Richard Spencer, who have tried to, you know, put, you know, white polo shirts and khakis on the Nazi movement? Yeah, so there's this whole ecosystem of the alt right, and I can get into why I call it that, but there's this whole ecosystem of these guys that's kind of under our noses because the internet means, you know, not everyone has to read the New York Times. They've got podcasts. Um, 100,000 listeners a week for some of them. They've got sort of think tanks. Um, So these guys all know each other, Um, and they're all connected. Kessler is kind of a newcomer. Spencer is known for being a publicity hound, but he does have a pretty strong organizational role. Um, He's involved with his own think tank, but also this um, thing that functions as kind of like a fraternity for white nationalists. It's called Identity Europa, you have to not have a criminal record, not do drugs, and uh, not have any racial admixture uh, to get in, right? So, and, and those are the guys that show up on the scene. So, yeah, they're all connected. Some people are more powerful than others. So why, why do you call them the alt-right? Because some people have said, oh, we should just call them white nationalists or white supremacists. They are white supremacists. Mm-hmm. But alt-right is different in that it signifies the demographics and the tactics, right? Like, Hmm. we have a hard time talking about class in America, but when people say Richard Spencer is dapper or articulate, what they're saying is he sounds upper middle class. He sounds like he went to an elite university. He sounds like me, right? So we we associate the Klan with rednecks, right? Yeah. Well, the alt-right is going for the college-educated guy, and they're using social media tactics uh, very sophisticated ones instead of burning crosses in people's yards. They have talked to me about how for the next demonstration they want to have stronger controls of aesthetics, which means no swastikas, because that's a, a dead political movement, and no, to quote them, white trash, because they want to look successful. Wow. You went to the memorial service for Heather Heyer last night and the vigil. What was that like? How, how are the people in Charlottesville doing right now? They're in shock. Heyer's memorial was 
very moving. Her family talked about her as a really passionate person who hated unfairness and injustice and would be very vocal about that, even if it got her into trouble. I thought it was really poignant that they weren't afraid to make it political. You know, they didn't talk about Trump or something, but they said, like, don't let her death be in vain. Go out and take action. People come up to me on the street in Charlotte, um, and they just all feel so shocked. They're very emotional. This thing that happened to their town, they didn't know it was coming. I talked to a man today. He said, you can tell it was a terrorist attack because we are all terrorized. I mean, the town is just sort of torn apart. But, but the vigil last night was a, a really healing moment, I think. How close were you to where the terrorist attack happened when it happened? Oh, just a few feet. I was standing around the corner in a doorway trying to get some shade, and we heard this like horrible, like loud, crunching sound, and then all these people screaming. So I backed against the wall. I was like, Is this, like does someone have a gun? No, it doesn't sound like a gun. And then we looked out, and it was... Then I realized that that sound was people's body being hit with the car. People keep asking me, how did you keep your composure in front of Nazis? Like, whatever, I'm not going to let them win. But, like, trying to hold it together when that happened, that was actually really hard. Yeah. I thought what was... I, I could imagine how hard it was for you to interview Cantwell. And, you know, you're trying to be... You were very good at asking him tough questions without pushing so much that he would get really angry with you. I thought that was a very, that, that must have been a hard balance to strike, right? Yeah, and you don't want to get in the weeds with them with their, like, quack eugenics theories. Right. Yeah, we also wanted to make this story about the event and not just a profile of Cantwell. He he did get quite mad at me. He's a emotional man. <laughs> I could tell that. <laughs> um, yeah. So since you've been covering the alt-right for a while, you know, what, what have you noticed about the success of their recruiting efforts? I mean, have you seen, you know, how short of it, how short of a distance is it between, you know, people who troll around on some of these right wing, alt right websites and, you know, people marching with torches in Charlottesville? It's hard to keep track of because uh, there's so many different social platforms, but they start really, really young. And what, you, Start, comes first is the misogyny, right? Mm-hmm. But like, it's these frustrated young men uh, who can't get dates. And then slowly it moves to more and more, as they call it, edgy stuff, the racism. So, something that I think is really telling is a term of art in their world is autist, A-U-T-I-S-T, as in someone who seems autistic. Like, they mm-hmm. use it both as an insult and as a badge of honor. And then when they swarm on something like the Clinton emails, like Pizzagate, like Shia LaBeouf's uh, protest art, they call that weaponized autism. The idea is that like a bunch of, you know, guys who don't have social lives, who have an obsession, who won't get off the Internet, are able to swarm and, uh, you know, basically cause news events to happen. How has Trump being president affected this movement and the people in it they love him they love him i mean they like he is they always tell me they always act surprised but happy when trump sort of throws them a bone right like uh like the holocaust statement where he didn't actually mention jews right they thought that was like they couldn't believe it like it was incredible to them right same thing with Tuesday. Um, one kid texted me like, my God, I love this man. He really does have our backs. Like, they don't actually believe he's one of them, that he believes in all of the race science and, like, you know, all the other quackery. But they think he's basically on their side. Well, Ellie, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for um, all the reporting that you're doing from Charlottesville. It's meant a lot to a lot of people. So appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Be safe out so there. Much. And everyone, uh, if you haven't watched already, which I know millions and millions of people have, uh, go check out uh, Ellie's reporting in Charlottesville, uh, Vice News Tonight, outstanding show, good friend of the pod, uh, Reed Sherlin, the head writer there. <laughs> go, uh, <laughs> yeah. go tell the whole crew we said hello and stay safe down there. I will do. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ellie. Bye.
Pod Save America is brought to you by Upside. Like we've been telling you for a while, if you travel for business, stop wasting time pricing your flights and hotels stop at the it. same old sites you used to go to. Guys, Tommy does not have a mic. We're down to two mics here in the studio. The so he's only, just going to be shouting. Guys, we're doing this from the studio. Our, Our studio, studio. The Crooked Studio. At Crooked Media HQ. You have two mics and one eagle that goes on the wall. <laughs> the only yeah. site you need is Upside.com. I've ordered some eagles. It's quick and easy for Upside to show you the exact flights you're looking for and the big name hotels you want to stay at. You can buy them separately or bundle them together. You can even add a ride. And by bundling two or more selections, you'll experience the real magic of using Upside. <laughs> See, the more you bundle, the more you save, the bigger the gift card you receive. It sounds like a, like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> it's very funny. You say scheme. You have funny pronunciation sometimes. Keep going. Period scheme. Yeah. Pyramid. Pyramid, not also, period. I, period I didn't scheme. correct you on the podcast, but you, you said uh, cachet. For I, I know. Cachet. Twitter, everyone, okay. thank you all for telling me <laughs> on Twitter that you know, I said cachet when John, I should have said cash. I want you to know there's a lesson there because I, I look like at my I veggies and I want to make, I take criticism. I didn't want to deal with what would happen if I told you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Twitter users, for telling me about cash. See, the more you bundle, the more you save, the bigger the gift card you receive to places like Amazon.com every time you buy a business travel package using Upside. And their expert navigators, in quotations, are always available 24-7 through phone, chat, social, and email to help anytime before, during, and after your business trip to make sure it goes smoothly. We use Upside. Their concierge level of service, again in quotation marks, is second to none. You get the VIP treatment while still paying low prices and being rewarded with gift cards every time you book. Upside's the real deal for buying your business trips. You got to give them a try. And right now, when you use promo code Crooked Media, ooh, okay, you're guaranteed to get at least one hundred dollar Amazon.com gift card on your package purchase. That's code Crooked Media to get a one hundred dollar gift card free. Upside.com, the better way to business travel. Minimum purchase required. See site for complete details. And of course, Pod Save America is brought to you by the Cash App. Cash App. We like the Cash App. Tommy doesn't have a mic right now because we're down to two mics. But the Cash App. You can also use it. Maybe your friends bought you some tickets to Pod Tours America. And and you got to pay them back. You got to pay them back. What do you use? Yeah. I've seen a lot of tweets about this. A lot of people saying, hey, I got you five tickets. Hey, my four friends, I'm going to tweet at you. You're going to use the Cash App. You're going to pay me back. And if you download the Cash App and you put in the code PODSAVE, you get five bucks in your pocket. Five dollars goes to Donors Choose, a fantastic charity that buys books for teachers in classrooms. So, you know, it's a two-step process. First, you convince your friend Derek. You say, Derek, you buy the tickets. Derek buys the tickets. And he says, hey, friend, you owe me the uh, cost of the ticket for uh, the fun night we're going to have seeing our friends at PODSAVE America in a live event. And you say, oh, you want your money, huh, Derek? Want your money? Download the Cash App. Very drawn out. Download the Cash App. And guess what? And if Derek hasn't had the Cash App before, now Derek downloads it. He puts in the code PODSAVE. Yep. And now he gets $5 and Donors Choose gets $5. Derek, what are you doing, Derek? Derek, do it. Cash App. End of Cash App. PODSAVE America is brought to you by Postmates. We love Postmates. We love Postmates. Download Postmates. You put in the code CROOKED. You get $100 free delivery. That's incredible. You order all the food during Game of Thrones. Or other just shows. I triggered love it. You do not... T- you did. Triggered. You, can't tri- so, oh you people he's can't so trigger me. triggered. You oh, two couldn't trigger you guys, me. he's coming across the desk at us. <laughs> I don't John, back I away. Am. I Roll away at our new my, barking. I think you can tell by my tone that A, I am not coming at them, and B, it's a podcast, yes, but a dog barking they could hear. You know, you could do a visual lie. I don't appreciate any of you who were tweeting about how Love it was right to change Tommy's TV. Yeah, oh, shut up oh, with the t- tweets about my TV. I want you all TV. to know how much I appreciated the fact that my canceling his dumb motion interpolation and dumb backlight settings helped his life, despite the fact that I was the subject of ridicule and scorn. Triggered. Triggered. <laughs> anyway, I don't Postmates. Know. Put in the code Crooked Guys, Crooked, hundred dollars free delivery. I cannot Get your help friends to that I've it. thrown my lot in with a couple of bros, but Postmates. I can get some food at my house with Postmates. Postmates. On the pod today, we also have from the Southern Poverty Law Center, Leisha Brooks. Leisha, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we're very familiar with SPLC on Pod Save America. For those who aren't, what does the Southern Poverty Law Center do? We do a few things. Primarily, we're a civil rights law firm, but we also have a project called the Intelligence Project that tracks and monitors hate and extremist groups. So we identify hate and extremist groups, and, and it's our wish to push them back 
to the margins. And we also have a project called Teaching Tolerance that provides free resources to educators on anti-bias topics. Has there been a a rise in the number of white supremacists and neo-Nazi groups during the Trump era? You know, we publish a map, a hate map, every year, and it comes out in February. I can tell you that, that without any surprise at all, that the numbers will increase. Um, all I have, the, fig- the figures that we have currently are for 2016. There were 917 active hate groups um, last year, 99 of them being neo-Nazi, and 130 Klan groups. We do expect that number to increase. We did see a note of an increase in the number of hate and bias incidents that happened in the immediate aftermath of the election, and people have talked about that a lot tying Trump's campaign and his successful election to the kind of the way the the right got so excited and emboldened and animated their um, their cause. And we saw that, I think, very clearly in Charlottesville. Have you seen a change, not just in the, the aggregate numbers of these individuals and these groups, but in their behavior since oh, Trump has oh, come yeah, on the yes, scene? Oh, yeah, that's what I mean when I um, refer to the emboldenment of them. It, it used to be last year, you know, kind of before before the presidential election, so let's go two years back, where, you know, they there was some shame around it. You didn't see white nationalists or white supremacists just out in public, you know, proudly proclaim, proclaiming who they were and trying to kind of take over, uh, as we saw in Charlottesville. Now, this began with the Trump campaign. As he entered the election on this kind of anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, um, with all that's this rhetoric that really enlivened the movement and it, and it made them feel that they had someone on their side. It goes back even further than that. If you go back to the election of President Obama, David Duke has said, has, has said that the election of Obama was really a wake-up call, and they used it as a kind of a recruitment tool. So, so they were laying low during the Obama years, um, very upset that, that, that he was reelected. But then in Trump, they saw kind of, you know, the last best hope. The nation has been experiencing kind of tremendous you know, demographic shifts, and uh, white nationalists and white supremacists will tell you that you know it's 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 white genocide. They they coined this term white genocide, which is a false narrative that you know whites are 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 losing all types of political power and trying to be pushed to the side because of multiculturalism and and, a, and an emphasis on diversity and inclusion. So the um, the election of Trump and these kind of code words around "Make America Great Again." and his focus on on nationalism um, really, really um, inspired them. So when he won the election, they were just delighted, just delighted, and came out in the streets, and that's when we saw the the uptick in the number of hate and bias crimes. I mean, the, the uh, you probably saw the images, all the images that were out, the swastika was back, you know, they changed to make America uh, great again, to make America white again. Um, these were all over the country, in places in the South, in the West, just everywhere. Um, we looked, digged into the data a little bit, and noticed that the primary motivation for these these bias incidents were based on anti-immigrant sentiment, which is no surprise because that was kind of the number one um, issue in Trump's campaign. It was closely followed by anti-black racism, which he didn't really speak to in his campaign much, but it reflects the, the ongoing anti-black racism in, in, in this country. So they felt like, you know, now that he has Bannon in his in his um, in his circle and Gorka, they have just beside themselves and feel like this is really their time. So that's when you that's when you find, you know, what happened in Charlottesville. We've never seen before all of these groups kind of come together in the way that they came together in Charlottesville. Before they were kind of just, you know, uh, doing their own thing and really not getting along well at all. But now they came together. Twelve different groups came together in Charlottesville to, you know proclaim proudly and loudly white supremacy. Have you gotten a sense of what their plans are post-Charlottesville? Are there other rallies that they're organizing in other cities across the country? Well, Richard Spencer has already announced his stop at uh, return to Texas A&M. And as I understand it, Texas A&M is is, is denying him the right to come, but I don't don't think that that'll stand. He's also announced that um, he's coming to the University of, of Florida in Gainesville. There are um, a couple of rallies scheduled for San Francisco at the end of this month, and there's something in Boston oh, yeah. uh, on Sunday, this weekend. What are some of the legal strategies that you guys use to fight some of these groups? 
Well, it's really difficult because we also kind of support, we do, kind of, we support the First Amendment and free speech. So they they are wrapping themselves kind of in this free speech. Uh, they're trying to position themselves as free speech martyrs, so we don't want to fall into that trap. They do have a right to express their their beliefs, no matter how important they are. We, we protect free speech, so we can't sue them on that, on those grounds. Our most recent lawsuit against a, a hate group, we just filed a suit against Andrew Anglin, who is the publisher of the Daily Stormer. That's the largest neo-Nazi site in the country. And we did that because he called a troll storm on our, on our client, whereby she was harassed and continues to be harassed by all of his followers. So when we can find a legal way to sue them for what they're doing, we will do that. We can't sue on, we can't abridge their First Amendment rights to, to, to you know, speak out. How can our listeners who are disturbed by this general trend and what happened in Charlottesville help do something about this problem in America? Well, I think that I'm encouraged. I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's very much like um, Heather Heyer's mother said yesterday. You know, this is an opportunity to amplify um, what, she, what Heather was doing and what, what people have been doing on the ground in terms of, of standing up against white supremacy. It's out, it's out there out of the closet. We can be out of the closet, too, and we should be. We should continue to take a stand against it, speak out, speak out loudly, make demands of our um, local, state, and federal officials, and tell them that we will not allow this. Regardless of what the president says, we have to come together as a people and, and say in a loud voice that we stand against white supremacy and white nationalism in all its forms. We have to push them back into the margins and not normalize this behavior. Lisa Brooks, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for the work all of you are doing at SPLC. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Bye. Take care. Thank you again to Vice News' Ellie Reeve and Leisha Brooks from the Southern Poverty Law Center for joining us today. And we'll see you again on uh, Monday. Bye, guys.